Well, our thanks to Rian for reading to us the passage this morning from Acts 2, verse 1 to 14. I was quite tempted to actually ask Rian to read the whole of chapter 2, uh, but it's quite long. There are 47 verses, and I took pity on her. And so we stopped at the crucial point where Peter begins his sermon on the day of Pentecost. Now, this is a great passage because this passage helps us ask the critical question, how could someone like me ever become a true Christian? Now, I'm really aware that there's lots of people now who are tuning into online services, and uh, it's absolutely wonderful, and we're so glad you're here. And we do pray that this service this morning will be a real blessing to you, and we will continue to pray for you during the week to that end. But probably if you've been watching online services for a while, you may find yourself thinking, well, could it be possible that someone like me could actually become a Christian? And if I was going to become a Christian, I think you'd probably be asking yourself, well, I want to be a proper one. I don't want to be just sort of a Sunday Christian, somebody who gets religion on a Sunday and then the rest of the week is, uh, uh, basically lives how they like. I don't want to be one of those, and I don't want to be somebody who's negative and critical and unhappy and all the rest of it. No, if I was going to become a Christian, I'd want to be a proper Christian. And uh, you might even find yourself asking, well, is it possible that someone like me could really become a true Christian? A lot of people who ask this question find themselves struggling because they say, well, I can understand it for other people, but... Really, I don't think it would work for me. And let's face it, when we think like that, we are saying that because we're actually being quite honest about the person we know we are. Now, I want to tell you this morning that this theme of Pentecost, today is Pentecost Sunday, or sometimes known as as Whit Sunday, holds out terrific hope and a wonderful answer to that question for you. How could someone like me ever become a true Christian? In Wales, there was often a tradition on Whit Sunday that uh, churches would have marches through the community. People would put on their Sunday best and uh, they would parade around the town, around the village, wherever they lived. And those marches were often called uh, a walk of witness. And I think the idea was, probably, that just as it was 2,000 years ago, on the very first Pentecost Sunday, when the good news of Jesus was announced to Jerusalem, their desire was, in their day, that by going on one of these marches around the community, they would announce something about the good news as well. Well, whatever it is, Today is Pentecost Sunday, and you might be asking yourself, well, well, what is it? What is Pentecost, and what does it mean? Pentecost actually comes from a Greek word, uh, 450, and uh, it's simply the word saying that it was 50 days, or identifying that it was 50 days after the Passover festival, which was the time when Jesus was crucified. So it's about 50 days Afterwards, hence Pentecost. Kind of ordinary description. It's a bit like if you went to someone's house and uh, they said to you, Well, this is the dog. And you say, Oh, lovely. What's her name? And they simply say, The dog. It's a very utilitarian view of looking at an animal, isn't it? The dog. Or giving the cat the name, The cat. Or the gerbil, The gerbil, or whatever it is. Well, when it comes to this particular event in the Christian calendar, there's a similar approach. It's 50 days, Pentecost. Now, the interesting thing about Pentecost is that it happened, the first one, took place at the same time as an old Jewish religious festival. And that festival was known in the Jewish religious calendar as the Festival of Weeks, or Shavuot in Hebrew. Uh, Religious festivals like this have been established by God 
uh, for his people. And really they did two things. The first was it helped them remember important spiritual lessons from the past. And then secondly, it also pointed them forwards to what we now see in the Lord Jesus. Now, the Festival of Weeks was basically a harvest festival that lasted seven weeks. I mean, we, we like harvest festivals. Occasionally I get invited to uh, speak maybe over in Carmarthenshire, in Pembrokeshire, in a rural community where they're having their harvest festival. It's usually for us, isn't it? The, uh, I think the last week, the last Sunday at the end of September. And it can be a great time. It can be a time of real thanksgiving to God for the blessing of the harvest. Well, back in the day of Peter, who's preaching here, and the apostles, the day of Pentecost takes place at the time of the festival of weeks, acknowledging God's goodness in the harvest, which had taken place in the fields and in the orchards and everywhere else. Now, it's actually quite significant that when you think about it. Because what's going to take place now on the day of Pentecost is going to launch and announce something that in its own way will be a harvest. Except a harvest of souls. A harvest of people. Now if Rian had actually read the whole of Acts 2, towards the end we would have come to a part, a part verse 41, where we're told that those who accepted Peter's message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So there was an immediate harvest on the first Pentecost of at least 3,000. And Bible scholars suggest that um, 3,000 would probably have meant they only counted the men. Things were pretty rough back in the day, 2,000 years ago for women. So we could probably even double that number, if not more. But it's a phenomenal number of people who put their faith and trust in Jesus. And it was the beginning of a harvest which has been going on for the last 2,000 years and is going on still today as boys and girls, men and women, come to faith in Jesus Christ. Now, the day of Pentecost has some remarkable things in it. And we're going to look at those in a few moments. And in the middle of it is this really long sermon that Peter preaches. And again, briefly, we're going to look at that in a few moments. But before we get down to the detail of what actually happened there at Pentecost, we find ourselves thinking and considering the fact that well, the day of Pentecost didn't just happen without any warning. Not that it was something that you needed to be warned against because it's a wonderful thing that happens. But Jesus had prepared his disciples for what happened at Pentecost on many occasions. And perhaps most significantly, he spoke to them about what was going to happen most clearly on the very night he was betrayed by Judas and then taken to Pilate and crucified. On that occasion, he was with his disciples in a room together. They were sharing a meal. And in the middle of that meal, he said many things to them. But one of the things he said was this, recorded for us in John's Gospel and chapter 16. I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away... The counsellor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. Now, what is Jesus saying there? He's saying something very important, not just for our understanding of the day of Pentecost 2,000 years ago, which of course it is. But he's also saying something that's really important to you and me as we live today in the 21st century, even in these COVID crisis days. So what is he saying? He's saying that he's making the point that, that when he would leave this world, and if you were with us last week, that's exactly what we were looking at when we considered the ascension, the news that Jesus is alive, 
But he's no longer physically in the world with us. But he has gone back into heaven. And in heaven, there he reigns as God and man. The one who perfectly understands you in all your struggles and in all your fears and concerns. Because he knows what it was like to live in this world and to experience so many things that are so common to us as human beings. But Jesus' point is this. When I go, I will send someone in my place. And the person he will send in his place is the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're new to Christian things, you might find yourself saying, well, I hear that phrase, the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit, or the Spirit of God, and there are lots of other ways in which the Bible refers to him, but, but what does that mean? Well, this is a big question, but to put it really as simply, and I hope as helpfully for you this morning, we need to remind ourselves of what the Bible tells us about God. Now, there are all sorts of ideas about God in the world today. Uh, I was looking at an online conference yesterday where there were all sorts of weird and wonderful things being said and really strange things. And someone said that each one of us is a God and there were all sorts of things. And I thought, this is very, very confusing. If you actually turn to the Bible, you see something with great clarity. And what you see is it answers the question, who is God, by effectively telling us that there is one God, not millions of gods, one God. But he exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I think if we're honest, most people can identify with the idea of Father and Son, but the Holy Spirit is a little bit more challenging, but it's clear from the Bible that each one of these three persons is equally God. You see that really clearly in the life of the Lord Jesus when he does those miracles. He does things that nobody else could do, not in a billion years. He walks on water, turns water into wine, speaks to the wind and the waves, suddenly they stop. He heals people with leprosy, opens the eyes of the blind, raises the dead. And the only explanation the Bible gives to us for that is that he's God. He's divine. Father, the Father is God. The Son is God. But the Spirit is God as well. And Jesus' point in the upper room was this. Listen, when I go back to heaven, I will send the Holy Spirit in my place. This is amazing. It means right now, as you meet in your home, and I'm in this building with Matthew at the back doing the sound and the vision so that you can enjoy this at home. The fact that Jesus is in heaven doesn't limit the reality and the prospect of God being present with you right now and he is present with you and may be present with you by his Holy Spirit so the Holy Spirit Jesus says is now going to do in the world what Jesus was doing while he was here and that's why in the upper room he actually refers to him in a very unusual way he says I will s the counselor he refers to him as being the counselor Unless I go away, back into heaven, the counsellor will not come to you. What's a counsellor? Well, if you've ever had any sort of emotional, uh, psychological needs, maybe you've gone to a counsellor. And what do you find with a good counsellor? Well, you find someone who, above everything, seeks to comfort you, to understand you, and to help you to understand the world in which you live. And the Holy Spirit functions as a, a counsellor to his people. For it's by the Holy Spirit that we are ultimately comforted in our troubled hearts. It's by the Holy Spirit giving us the Bible that we can really understand ourselves and really understand the world. I think Jesus summed all of this up best in this little phrase, which again was in the upper room. In John's Gospel, chapter 14. 
I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. He knows he's going to the cross, but ultimately back to heaven in the ascension. But he says, I won't leave you as orphans. Christians are not orphans. They don't meet in the memory of Jesus. They meet in the presence of Jesus. They don't speak about one in the same way you might speak about Plato or Socrates, who left us writings to stretch our brains and make us think about the world. No, the teachings of Jesus are very different. For as in the Bible we encounter him and what he has said, he really does meet with us. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And his coming to us is through the Holy Spirit. In fact, this is so clear that in the book of Acts, we, and there's a wonderful part in chapter 16 where in one verse, the Holy Spirit is called the Holy Spirit. And in the very next verse, he's called the Spirit of Jesus. So Pentecost was all about the moment when Jesus ascended in heaven, sends the Holy Spirit to his people in the way he promised. It's a wonderful moment of him being present again amongst his people. There's one other quick thing we can say about this. As well as being a comforter, the Holy Spirit is an enabler. He enables us to do things. He enables the church to do something, which otherwise, without his presence, they would not be able to do. And what is that? Well, in the seconds before Jesus ascended into heaven, we're told in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that Jesus said to his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Now we're gonna see in a moment, that's exactly what happens at Pentecost when Peter gets up to preach. And I've already told you that at the end of that day, at least 3,000 people gave their hearts to Christ. There is something powerful happening. It's not the power of manipulation. It's not the power of mass hypnosis, as some have tried to suggest over the years. But the Bible's claim is it is the power of Christ, present with his people, through the Holy Spirit. Now, power can be a threatening word, an intimidating word. When you hear it, you probably put up your defenses. And in the area of faith and religion, power can sometimes be terribly ugly and awful and controlling. The phrase is like the power of the priest or the power of the chapel, the power of the minister. Sometimes can have very dark overtones. The power of the Holy Spirit is completely different. This is the power of love. The power of mercy and grace that enables an ordinary group of individuals, the disciples 2,000 years ago, from a rural backwater in Israel, most of them at least, from Galilee, to be able to go to the capital city, Jerusalem, and not just there, through the whole of Judea, and then into a nearby country where people hated the Jews, Samaria, and to have an eye on the whole world to go into all of this, preaching and teaching and explaining the good news of Jesus. You know, this really does link with our opening question. How can someone like me be a true Christian? And the answer is, in part, so that really important question that I know you're thinking about is that actually it is really down to the power of Christ in and through the Holy Spirit. 
Now, we need to unpack that a little bit, don't we? So let's ask ourselves the question, what happened when the Holy Spirit came? Now, to be honest with you, there were some very unusual things. And to help us work through this, uh, we're going to look at it in three sort of key areas. The first is we're going to see now is what happened to the disciples when the Holy Spirit came. Now, in the passage that Rian read to us, we read in verse 2, 3, and 4 these words. Suddenly, the sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues or other languages as the Spirit enabled them. There's a lot of strange things happening there. But actually, I want to remind you that if the Holy Spirit is who the Bible claims he to be, God, we would expect strange things to happen when he himself filled the lives of his disciples. There's the sound of a mighty blowing wind. There are what appears to look like flames resting on each one of the disciples. And suddenly they start speaking in languages that they had never previously been able to speak. Now I want to come clean. It is utterly and completely supernatural. It is. This is the power of God. Now, over the years, people have come to this passage and sometimes commented on how uh, wind represents this, about God, fire, and that sort of thing. And uh, some of that, I'm sure, is very, very helpful. But I can't help thinking, when we come to this passage, of asking the question, in this unusual moment, is there anything else in the Bible itself that came near to this? And I found my thoughts drifting towards a fascinating moment in the life of an Old Testament character who was a prophet called Elijah. Now, he was a prophet at a time when it seemed no one took God seriously or wanted to listen to him. And we actually find that the particular story in the life of Elijah takes place at a time when Elijah had really had enough. He really was very depressed. In fact, he was quite suicidal. So we read in the Old Testament that uh, Elijah came to a certain tree called a broom tree. He sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. So here's a man who's reached an end of himself. And he's completely in despair. Well, the Lord steps in. And to cut a long story short, he steps in to comfort Elijah. That's interesting, isn't it? To be Elijah's comforter. He does things like send an angel down from heaven to touch him. Touch is important, isn't it, when you're in despair? To reassure him. And he feeds him. In fact, he gives him breakfast in bed. And eventually, Elijah goes on a journey. And he comes to a place where God wanted him to be. And there he experiences some really dramatic things. There's a terrific wind, followed by an earthquake, followed by fire. And then we're told he heard a gentle whisper. Now, significantly, we're told that as dramatic as those things were, God was not in the wind, the earthquake or the fire, but he was in the gentle whisper. And there God speaks to Elijah to comfort him and to encourage him. Now, why is that helpful in our understanding of the day of Pentecost? Well, there are these unusual things happening. Verse 2, sound of a wind, blowing of a violent wind. Verse 3, what looked to be like tongues of fire coming to rest on the disciples. These things are fascinating, aren't they? But just as it was in the story of Elijah, where God was not in the wind, not in the earthquake, not in the fire. 
but he was in the gentle whisper. So our focus on the day of Pentecost must be on the fact that God really works, not through the mighty wind that came into the building, not through seeing the tongues of flame, but he really works when the disciples begin to speak. Now their speaking on the day of Pentecost is really miraculous. They suddenly found they could speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them. And to make the point, uh, Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, gives us a list of these languages. Verse 8, the crowd there, sorry, verse 7, the crowd naturally would gather around, and we're told they gathered in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking, the disciples speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked. Are these not all these men who are speaking Galileans? How is it we hear them speaking in our own native language? And we get a list of those languages, or at least the places where these people came from in the crowd. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, people from uh, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, Libya, Cyrene, Rome, Crete, uh, Cretans, uh, loads of people from all over the world. In fact, these are real places where you can go today. And if you go there today, you will find that people often speak different languages from one another. Suddenly, on the day of Pentecost, these ordinary blokes, fishermen, manual workers, there were one or two blue-collar workers amongst them, but not very many, suddenly they are word-perfect in these other languages. That was the work of the Holy Spirit. But it was done for a very clear purpose. And what was that? So that people from all over the world might begin to hear the good news of Jesus and what he's done. You see, it's the reminder that at the heart of everything, God's concern is that the world might hear of who his son is. And in a very dramatic, symbolic way, really, he makes it possible on the day of Pentecost by enabling his disciples to speak in these previous langu languages that previously they could not speak suddenly and perfectly so that they could communicate the news of Jesus to people. So what happened to the disciples was really, really remarkable. But the second thing we see here is that there were some pretty remarkable things that happened to the crowd who were listening to this. Now, one of the wonderful things I think for me personally when I read this is it's the fact that God uses Peter to preach the sermon. Now, there were all the disciples were there. You thought he could have used Luke. Luke, we think, was a doctor and a bright guy and a scholar probably very eloquent and articulate. Or he could have used John, who goes on to be known as the Apostle of Love, who had a wonderful heart for God and for people, but instead he uses Peter. And what's really interesting is that it's only been 50 days since Peter denied Jesus three times. You know this man from Galilee, don't you, who's been arrested? Nope, never seen him before. Go away. Never seen him before. He denied having anything to do with Jesus three times. And it filled Peter's life with great shame and great bitterness until Jesus gently restores him. But Peter's a casualty. He's not straightforward at this moment. He's failed. Can he be relied on again? Can he really be trusted to speak truthfully and faithfully about Jesus. And the very disciple you might have had questions about is the very one God chooses to do the preaching. I just think that's wonderful as a preacher because it reminds me that God, as Paul tells us in the second Corinthians, has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the strong, the foolish things, to confound the wise. And, and you might be watching this this morning, you might be saying, why should I listen to you? You haven't even got a university degree. You don't know much about it, you know, anything other than the Bible. Why should I listen to someone like you in a little chapel building, preaching online in a small part of West Wales? 
And we live in a world of great sophistication, great eloquence, and big cities and big universities and all the rest of it. Why should I listen to you? Well, amazingly, God delights to use the weak things of the world to confound the strong. Ordinary, fallible human beings to do his work. So Peter preaches. And uh, he preaches quite a long sermon, actually. And I'm going to cut it really short and tell you it comes down to one thing. What's that? Well, he uses the Old Testament. By the way, that's really interesting. It's the reminder, isn't it, that the best preaching is the preaching about the Bible. That's what Peter does. So he quotes from an Old Testament prophet called Joel. He quotes from the book of Psalms. But his big concern is to speak to the crowd about Jesus. What was Peter's sermon about? It was about the fact that Jesus, who had been crucified, had been raised from the dead. And the whole thing is summed up in verse 36, which is really towards the end of Peter's sermon. Let all Israel be assured of this, he said. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified. Boy, was that interesting. There were actually people literally in that crowd who'd shouted at Pilate's court, crucify him, crucify him. They may well have been some of the religious leaders who had conspired in the night to have Jesus arrested. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He is the Messiah. Now we're told that as Peter preached, something amazing happened. And this is the wonder, and it comes back to our original question. How can someone like me become a true Christian? And the answer is, as Peter was preaching, and a lot of what Peter said to the crowd, the crowd already knew. They probably knew vast swathes of the book of Psalms by heart. They would have known the, what the prophet Joel had written his prophecy. It, this wasn't new stuff. They'd been brought up with it, with, the, with their mother's milk. They knew these things. But as Peter preached, Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, works. Where does he work? He works on the hearts of the hearers. And this is how God does his work. As we hear about Jesus, and that news addresses our minds, which is so important, the Holy Spirit not only helps us understand in our minds, but he, he deals with our hearts. We're told in verse 37, they interrupted Peter. When the people heard this, what had they heard? The news that God had made this Jesus, whom they'd crucified, both Lord and God. He said, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? We're in trouble. We crucified the Messiah. Suddenly their consciences and their hearts are affected. And this is what God does when he brings someone like you to a place of faith and trust and becoming a true Christian. He works by his Holy Spirit on, his, on the heart. Now, I don't think for one minute there'd be the sound of a strong, mighty wind and tongues of fire and seeing people suddenly speaking in a foreign language they'd never spoken before. No. Do you know, it could be even right now, as you sit in your home, listening to this, you're just aware that this stuff that I've kept at arm's length for all of my life, I've never really been anti it or negative, I just never really had much time for it, suddenly has become really important to you. Really interested. And the more you hear about Jesus, that he died on the cross and rose from the dead and is alive now, and you find yourself saying, well, actually, yeah. I actually think I get that. I believe that. What's going on? What's going on in your life if that's happening? This is the work of the Holy Spirit. Quietly. 
sensitively, gently convincing you of who Jesus is. Well, many that day responded. They accepted the message. They were baptized. As Peter had told them, you need to repent. Change your way of thinking. You need to be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit wasn't just for the disciples. But he is and he was for everyone who trusts in Jesus. You might be someone this morning who finds yourself saying, Oh, I'm really sorry. You know, I, I feel these things and I, I'd love to put my faith in Jesus, but I've got this thing in my life and I'm, I'm not sure I could ever give it up. Or I'm not sure I could ever really live as a Christian, really should live. And, and after all, I want to be a proper one if I'm going to be a Christian. I don't want to just be a Sunday Christian. Hey, listen, just as the Holy Spirit is convincing you right now of who Jesus is, he promises to take up residence in you. And the same power which has led to convince you that Jesus is Lord and that you need him is the same power which will enable you to live for him. Trust him for that. Well, the last thing really as we close is, I suppose, is what this means to you. And I suppose in many ways I've been asking this, haven't I? We've seen what the coming of the Spirit meant for the disciples. Suddenly they have great power to speak. We've seen what it meant to the crowd. They were cut to the heart. They believed. 3,000 are converted, become real Christians. But what about you? As we close here this morning, I just want to say to you that the experience of the crowd on the day of Pentecost has been repeated millions of times in the lives of ordinary people all over the world over the last 2,000 years. It's been repeated right now as boys and girls and men and women are coming to this place where they say, this old book with its message and its stories, has suddenly become real to me. It's become alive. And Jesus, rather than somebody out there way, way in the distance of my thinking, suddenly now, I realize I need him. I need his forgiveness. I need his love. And I need his peace. And people are taking that step. Which I want to invite you to take this morning. That step of out of the quietness of your heart. Responding to what God is saying to you. And trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. May God help you to not only understand these things today but to respond to them. And like those who were in the crowd 2,000 years ago, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If we can be any help to you at all in this matter, here in Llanelli, in this little corner of West Wales, we're here for you. You can email us, info at lfec.org. Whatever you send to us will be treated in absolute confidence. If you say, well, I'd like to read this for myself. Brilliant. But I haven't got a Bible. Don't worry. Get in touch with us. We'll send you one. Free. And that's all. We'll send it to you. If there's anything we can do at all to help you discover and understand more clearly the wonder and the beauty of Jesus Christ and his power to change someone like you to become a real Christian. We'll do all we can to help you. God bless you this day. We're going to sing now to close our service.